Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 507, featuring an interview with Mr. Anna Bross. Uh, now, Anna has the world's largest collection of PC games in their boxes. It's magnificent stuff. He's got more than just the games. He's got all sorts of paraphernalia, collectibles, uh, memorabilia, you name it. The guy's got it. It's some fantastic stuff. Plus, he's done some of his own games, and I thought it was high time we had him on the show. Uh, we've got a lot to cover, so without further ado, here is the PC King, Mr. Anna Bross. Hi folks, I am here with Anna Bross, the PC King. Guinness World Record Order. <laughs> order. <laughs> world Record, maybe that too. World Record Holder of PC Game Boxes. Uh, I've heard you got a couple of game boxes. Is that true? You probably got a few. <laughs> one or two games <laughs> yeah look at the and, and nice long hair too i think that's that's key right you gotta have i mean yeah, your collection is, is is incredible let me just show this maybe as a way uh, for people that haven't haven't seen this yet you know this is what you got on your website mm -hmm. and this just wow <laughs> Oh, look at those Baldur's Gate got the Planescape Torment. You know, I'm going to pick your brain before this is over because, you know, I, I've got severe collection envy, <laughs> obviously, but also display envy. I think you probably know more about how to actually display this stuff. Yeah, this is in a in a museum, so uh, the yeah. lighting and the yeah, well, like the way uh... you, you've arranged the boxes. I mean, this is. You know, I don't know if I could ever leave if I ever ended up here. Yeah, I got the same problem. <laughs> when I'm there in a the museum, then I'm like, I could I could be there for for months probably. Oh, look at that elite stuff there. Oh yes, I love elite. Such a great game, mind blowing game as well. Oh, a nice fall up. Oh, I even have the little uh, bomb there. Yeah, you're like way beyond just the boxes. You have a lot of uh, the memorabilia. Yeah, not to mention the, the beers there as well. The Fallout beer is a really Wait a minute. rare item. Fallout what? Beer. During beer? the release of Fallout 3, I believe. There's a Fallout um, beer? Yeah, that was for all the, the people that made uh, for the release party. They had Fallout beer made. Um, mm -hmm. And only the people who worked there uh, got, uh, got to drink it. But they saved it, uh, a few for, uh, for their own... I say it for their own company, for their own uh, display. Um, but when I was there at the Bethesda uh, in the Netherlands, um, I visited and they they saw my collection and my passion, uh, and they decided to to give this uh, to donate it to uh, to the collection to the museum. And they gave you these beers, and you never you never opened them up and drank them. Yeah, well, the thing is, when you open them up, it's sort of Oh, that would be the ultimate torture for me. <laughs> <laughs> like, here's these fallout beers. But by the way, you probably don't want to drink them because you can't. Once you drink them, you can't drink them and have them. Oh, my God. Exactly. That's that's a bit the point. Yeah, it's a bit with sealed games as well. Do you do you peel off the seal and then open the game? Well, that's a, a slightly different, but hey, oh, it's, it's oh, a little bit of the same with ball game. I can't stand it. I the first thing I do is rip that seal right off because you know, somebody was uh, referencing one of my earlier videos. I'll, I'll see what your thoughts are about this. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always thought, especially if it's a game, I don't collect, you know, just anything. You know, I, I just get the games I really like and I played a lot and mean a lot to me. So my theory is nobody's ever going to like it as much as I do. <laughs> so, so that opening up the, the plastic is probably going to mean more to me other than it would to many people, especially after, you know, some people, I guess, collect games to, uh, you know, with a monetary value in mind, almost like an investment. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's just the opposite of my approach. And I, I suspect well, yours too. I think I'm a little bit in the middle um, mm -hmm. where I, I sometimes open it because I really want to know what's inside. I really want to display the goodies that are inside. Uh, for example, um, you probably know uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy from Infocom. Oh, uh, yeah, Doug Adams. Yeah, those goodies inside, is the, those are the best. And you need to be able to show them, right? So that's, uh, that's something that, 
yeah, then if it would be sealed, then I would definitely take the seal off. It's really dark in my room there, just get in sunlight. So, yeah, it's like a conundrum, you know, I, I horrify people with that. You know, they'll, <laughs> sometimes they'll, they'll send me a game, somebody, uh, you know, a fan of the show will send me something and it'll be sealed. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm going to take that seal off, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've noticed sometimes uh, with the, especially with some of my really old games like the Atari ones, mm. the uh, if you keep the plastic on, it'll actually start to damage the box and like crumple. You ever? Ah, yes. It? When the seal is too tight and it get only gets tighter around it, and you uh, yeah you see some of the dents into uh, the boxes. Yeah, and it's really sad to see. What is your solution to that problem? Take off the seal. <laughs> Yeah, 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 I would, or maybe, yeah, I'm not sure if there's another way, but uh, sort of slightly open the seal so it gets more space or room, so the air gets out in a way. Um, but it's mostly the tightness of it, and then it's, it's, um, yeah, the only way to save it then is, is take off the seal. I don't know and if maybe, I saw you I'm could not. put a, protect, a protection box around it if you like. There are custom made protection boxes um that you can buy at places uh, i don't use it that much i do use it for my uh, uh super nintendo and my nintendo games and my game boy games uh but not for my pc games uh, you, you liked a lot more than, than the pc mm. yeah are you, are you a, also a console gamer or mostly only pc right. you know i'm probably a 10 percent console all right all right you know, somewhere around there it's just you know, as far as, collecting, as far as collections go, I typically do the, the PC stuff too. Just yeah, because yeah. Uh, die hard, nice. You know, the Super the Nintendo stuff and all that can get really expensive in a hurry. But I, I, I find that there's fewer people that collect for PC. Mm, true for me as well. I, I started out as a Nintendo collector, oh, uh, so and and Game Boy a little bit. Um, and when I had around maybe seventy to one hundred games, um. Not all boxed, but all, also cartridges. Uh, I was like, uh, and then I got a few PC games, and I was like, these PC games, they, I, I had more of a personal attachment to them uh, than I had with this uh, Super Nintendo games or the Nintendo games. Uh, I played more PC games as well, uh, so I was like, why, why shouldn't I collect those? And I didn't know other people that were collecting box PC games back then, so. I was like, yeah, let's let's go for it. Let's collect them all and see where where the ship strands. So see where we go. Uh, so adventure takes us. My sister-in-law is the, the Nintendo collector. Mm. You know, the family. She's got a pretty uh, respectable collection. I'm like, well, you know, maybe we don't need two of those in the same family because I, I would hate <laughs> to be like in a combat with her. <laughs> you know, I want that in my collection. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that might be tough. Uh, maybe if it's your your girlfriend or or your wife, then it's maybe even harder. To, to sort of separate things, or so those is more; those are my more my games, and those are more your games. You know, now that you mentioned it, my brother, yeah, her uh, her husband, my brother, he's uh, he doesn't do the Nintendo stuff. He's more into PC as well. So maybe that's what's preserved there. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Ah well. Yeah, like uh, you know, not just the you know one of the things that she talks about is that it's hard to find, really hard to find boxes. The Nintendo stuff was almost everybody just took, you know, they they, had, they took the cartridge out of the box, threw away the box. You know, probably yeah. to some extent the PC. There's probably somebody watching this video right now that's like, oh man, back in the day I had all these wonderful big boxes and I took the discs <laughs> out and I put the discs in a, you know, I still had the floppy discs maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it happened to me. I mean, I, I did collect, uh, well, I didn't collect them. I was sort of playing games back in the day and I had a few boxed PC games, but in the later time, I just uh, threw them away or sold them or gave them away. Um, and later later finding out that I really liked them and I started to collect them more. Um, so yeah, then I had to sort of start over, start from scratch again, uh, but yeah. It, it's totally worth it and uh, and it's a sort of learning process but back in the day times were definitely different i mean uh when you want to collect games now uh it's so much more difficult with the the, the social media and um all these uh websites where you can buy stuff i mean 
everybody just jumps on them. And there's so many more collectors than there were back in the day, uh, especially that last part. Uh, and also a lot of scammers, uh, people faking things. So yeah, definitely uh, you have to really keep an eye out on, on things. And also the, the, there's sort of, I feel like there's a sort of wave where you can sort of ride on for collecting. Um, and I was on the on the PC game, the box PC game wave when people were just throwing all these boxes away. I was like, all right, now it's the time to to jump in and buy them. And we're yeah. talking about years back, right? Maybe 15 years ago. Um, so that was my luck, I think. And well, after the PC came more, uh, uh, also for Nintendo, there was like a, a, a moment where a lot of Nintendo games, even boxed Nintendo games, were pretty cheap. Um, I got a, a, the cartridge of uh, Little Samson. I'm not sure if you know it. It's a very rare uh, game. I got it for seven euro and fifty cents uh, on a Queen's Day market, and those that was not uncommon back then. That was that was not rare. It happened just a lot because people didn't know what they were worth, and yeah, people just bought them because they liked them and they were done with playing it and they sold them. That's just how it went. But because of the internet and because of yeah, how how uh, other collectors share their passion. Uh, uh, more people know about what things are worth and they know the prices. Uh, and yeah, like, uh, yeah, maybe like channels like these uh, or from LGR of Metal Jesus Rocks, uh, you know, uh, Pushing Up Roses, Angry Video Game Nerd, uh, you name it. Um, all these people, they help um, with sort of creating more collectors. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. More, more people getting passionate about it and uh, sharing your treasure hunt online and uh, people get excited. So yeah, it's definitely, um, I think a hundred times more collectors than back in the day. I mean, in my experience, I'm a kind of an opportunistic collector. Hmm. You know, I got most of my stuff. I would be in Goodwill or Savers, you know, it's thrift shop basically. Yeah. Yeah. Or scan the Craigslist dads. Never, you know, I could probably still find some guys like, ah, get rid of all my old PC games. You know, I want like five bucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, that, but I noticed this, I, you know, once you get one of these uh, computer shops or like gaming collector kind of gaming shops in town, mm -hmm. you know, the first thing they do is just they'll buy up all that market. You know, so it's kind of this mixed blessing because on the one hand, it's really cool to get to go to a shop like that and, and you're there with somebody like, that knows a lot about it and you can have mm -hmm. great conversations but yeah now it's like 50 dollars for that yeah <laughs> instead of a buck so uh yep. well, it's convenience <laughs> but uh hers. yes it's a, it has been a hassle and i've, I've never been a, a businessman like that myself um i know a lot of people that that definitely at, at these markets they buy them to sell them for for more uh later on um I've never had it in me. I, I sort of, it, it didn't feel right to me. I just, I only buy things that I really want for my collection. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that, that, yeah, I, I, I sort of. A, a, one of my first bosses was a lady that was really into Barbie. All right. Barbie, I was just thinking about that because of the movie. And, you know, and every time there'd be a new Barbie come out, she'd buy like five of them. Oh, you know, wow. Stick them in a yeah. safe deposit box. And I yeah. think she probably had to move it to an upgrade. But yeah, she didn't actually care anything about the, uh, the Barbies, it was just kind of as, as an investment. Mm. You know, I'm just not that way. Uh, no, me neither. But it's, uh, it, it's yeah, uh, it's that might be a thrilling me. ride as well. And I think, yeah, there, there are always people like that. And uh, yeah, we collectors uh, sort right. of have to deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> Inadvertently encouraging them. You know, yeah. something else uh, I was going to, see what you thought about this i've been thinking a lot about collections obviously thinking mm -hmm. about yours and prepping for this uh, for this interview with you and i was thinking about what makes pc game collecting you know what are some of the differences between that and nintendo or whatever and one of the things i thought about was the role that piracy played mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, how many of us just had all these pirated copies? I'm sure I probably have a box somewhere with just the old floppy disk with like the handwritten, <laughs> you know, label. That's definitely true. That's how I got into PC you know, games. Something you probably didn't have. Uh, I guess there was some of that on the console side, but you know, what what factor do you think that plays? 
I, a big one, definitely. Yes, for me, uh, the PC gaming was everything. And I did, I did have friends with Nintendo and Super Nintendo, and I, I played it myself as well. And later on, I uh, got my own Nintendo, and I sort of saw other collectors collecting, which made me enthusiastic as well. Uh, but the PC games were always the things that that were my thing. Uh, but I never had an or, or almost never had original games. I always had pirated games, uh, copies from copies from copies from friends and uh, from the colleagues of my father. Um, and um, that, yeah, that got me into gaming and got me excited about uh, Prince of Persia and Commander Keen and uh, those games from back in the day. Um, and yeah, my, my father was, uh, he really liked Sokoban. That was one of his favorite games. I'm not sure if you know it. It's like pushing crates on the right spot. <laughs> sure. And um, so, yeah, yeah and I, I could go on and on about all these games that I played back then and I got so excited and were a few that standed out and yeah, that uh, I never got over that. And then all of a sudden, I found uh, I found out that these games came in boxes, and that they, <laughs> these boxes were actually pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, sort of like this is the original thing that, mm -hmm. that I used to play back then. And I got really excited about that. Yeah, I was like that. I you know, the same thing with all the pirated copies, but I noticed there's a lot of games like Bard's Tales when the Bard's Tale or Tales of the Unknown. I'm sure you're familiar with that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I tried to play that game off, but, you know, it worked on the pirated copy, but I didn't know what the heck I was doing. You know, I didn't have a manual. <laughs> you, need to, you needed, like, to buy the game mm. so you would have the manuals because you, you did actually, I mean, it was not like a simple arcade game. I mean, if you read the instructions, you wouldn't know what, what the heck you were doing. I always wonder if maybe that's why there were so many games like that on the PC <laughs> side because they knew that and they're like, because that was my, the first game I ever bought. <clears throat> you know, I actually got the box was Bard's Tale. Mm. You know, for that reason, one is uh, I I love the record or album cover. Yeah, for, yeah, it's a really it's nice so shape. Good. But yeah, it was to get that little manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a map inside as well, and. Um... Oh yeah, the map. So it's really beautiful, and also the the images on the PC as well. It takes you right in. It's such a storytelling game, really great. I noticed you. I don't know if this is still true, but I found uh, on your website somebody had asked you what is your what is your favorite game, and you said Day of the Tentacle. Hmm. Oh, it's my first game. Favorite your first uh, your first game that you bought was Day of yeah. the Tentacle. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's. Uh, Good, that was a great game, by one of my favorites. Too. <laughs> yes, I, I um, the first adventure game that I played that got me extremely excited was Monkey Island, and um, my brother and my cousin, my two cousins, were both playing it, uh, and I looked over their shoulder. I was a bit too young to to understand it all what was going on, but I just loved the images, and it was so. I mean, the, the the atmosphere was so so amazing. The music was good, and it, oh, the music. yeah, it was. It, I really went into that game. Um, just also in my fantasies, when when we were done with the game, I was sort of playing around like Guybrush Street with myself. Um, and yeah, that was uh, that was when I got really excited about. Um, an adventure game, uh, so to speak. Uh, also, the gameplay was really good, like this, this point and click thing. And then I got sort of to got to learn Lucas Arts. Um, so it was Monkey Island Two. And we knew that there was a, a second part, and uh, it was quite difficult to find a, a, a copy <laughs> of that game uh, to get it to to work on your computer. Uh, computer but eventually, you, we what computer were you playing it on? Sorry. Replay on the PC version or DOS version, I guess. Yeah, both. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, exactly. The the both were the DOS version, I think. Um, you didn't have these icons or for for your inventory at the first uh, Monkey Island game. Um, obviously, there was no dog uh, image. If like this uh, this uh, portrait image of the dog that uh, they had to cut out because of uh, uh, disk space. Um, it's a well, it's a story for another time, but um, 
but yeah, that, those were. Uh, then I got really excited about these games, and I sort of figured out that these adventure games were were my thing. Um, but it was really hard to come by uh, good adventure games. But I knew that when I was playing a Lucas Arts game, I was I, I knew that I was on the right track, and that it was always uh, a, a, a good ride. Um, and then it's much different than those Sierra games at the time. Mm. Those are brutal. <laughs> those are definitely brutal. Yeah, I, I did uh, find them out later. Um, so I got to play the Sierra games, and I they they are amazing as well. Um, but yes, you die a lot. Uh, plus, you don't have the point and click element, which is uh, a small thing. But I know I'm I'm not an English speaker natively, so. Uh, yeah, it was kind of hard to find the right phrases for everything. Oh, it was hard for everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that that helped a lot in that sense. Uh, but I got to enjoy a lot of share games later on. Uh, but still, um, my heart went a little bit uh, more for for Lucas Arts. Uh, you grew up in. Are you still live in the Netherlands? Did you grow up there? Yeah, I grew up there. I lived there. Still do. And. Uh, um, the Netherlands was very well known for pirating and shareware, but a lot of pirating. We had these these Twilight CDs uh, that were going around with that, which had around thirty full games on there. Um, but then, uh, like a lot of music was taken away, or cinematics were taken uh, away to make it all fit on this CD, oh. because that was the things. Those were the things that, that take a lot of space. Um, so you were like Monkey Island. I mean, the music is the uh, true. Yeah, when the, sometimes the music did work. It hurts my soul to think about somebody playing that without their music. <laughs> yeah, well, mostly yeah. like MIDI music or stuff like that could fit on there because it was small. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could play uh, the game with different kind of uh, settings with music. Um, but yeah, a lot of games uh, didn't have the music. Yeah, that was uh, a big miss. But that did. That way, you could play a full game for pretty cheap. Um, yeah, I think the Netherlands was like that back in the day, and a lot of shareware as well. We had these uh, these stores with discats on the counter, and you can just pick a few for a, uh, for a buck um, or two, and then uh, yeah, play that out of them and see what you like, and and never being able to buy them with your own money because they were too expensive in the end. <laughs> Until later. Um, it seems like the I, Netherlands has always had, I mean, I don't know what I'm talking about, but, you know, it just seems like it had a pretty good gaming scene there. Mm. You know, game studies, a lot of a lot of those game studies guys are from the Netherlands. And... Well, especially nowadays, uh, back in the day, it was it was kind of small. Um, it started off, the, the first big company in the Netherlands was Radarsoft, which went, made games for the Commodore 64 and the MSX. Um, and they also went abroad with their games, so not only uh, national games, but internationally, uh, which was really big. Um, and I just recently got a game from them that I was searching for years, and it's uh, hopeless. Oh, wow. <laughs> is it mirrored? I'm not sure. Oh, you can see. All right, so this is uh, one of those games from Microsoft. I'm not sure if you can see it, but it has like a big... A big map on there. Is that an original seal on there? No, no, no. It's not an original seal. It's like a protection uh, thing around it just to keep it uh, oh, that's a good away from the dust. You know, you put the little baggie on there. Yeah, it makes it look uh, shiny. Hopeless. <laughs> Hopeless. Yes. That's a good title. Or is that a good title? Eh? <laughs> it's, it is a good title. And uh, the thing is that um, it's a really difficult game, but it's also... Uh, the, the maker of that game also made it sort of made it in a way that it was almost impossible to to finish because back in the day you need to have games that you could play for a long time um, because you only had like a couple of games and that you have to do it a whole year with them. Uh, it's a, a bit different from nowadays where you have too many games to choose from. You you can't finish every game even in a whole lifetime. But um, yeah, back then you just had a couple, and this is one of those games where which is pretty difficult. Yeah, that's a good comparison to draw between the Sierra games and the, the Lucasfilm 
mm. games. I mean, the Sierra guys, I've talked to a couple of them, and they're like, yeah, we don't we don't want somebody to actually be able to finish the game. <laughs> yeah. But then they're like, well, you know, you want them to keep playing this for weeks and weeks or even months. Yeah, exactly. So I don't know how well that worked out for them because – I guess they sold a lot of clue books. Well, that's that's the part with that's also why you see less and less adventure games because they are harder to make uh, in that sense. Like uh, big adventure games are more difficult to make than, for example, big shooter games or big football games. I don't know, or like these re- repetitive kind of games are uh, are way easier to make than than a full adventure game with where everything has to be. Uh, has to have a good story and the story needs to continue for for long times and that you have to get on different places and a lot of puzzling um, needs to be thought of like these great puzzles it needs to to be a good puzzle uh, so you never get bored and the, the balance in that for adventure games is really hard to find um, and that's why i think less and less adventure games are being made yeah i, talk, I don't know if you saw the videos i did with the stasis <laughs> those stasis guys are doing some um point and click adventures kind of a sci-fi horror thing <laughs> all right it was probably really easy for some people but uh yeah it took me i think about two hours to get all out of the first chapter okay <laughs> like wow, yeah, yes. i got i know i got to do something you, you get into that state of mind where you're like i'm gonna try everything on everything mm-hmm. oh yes you know oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did that with uh, Discworld and Monkey Island as well. I these, these, yeah, try everything on everything to see <laughs> where it goes. Um, but yeah, those those were the times where you had to do that, or you had you needed to have a magazine uh, or like a printed walkthrough from a friend. Um, yeah, usually we we played a lot of games with the walkthroughs because, but we only used the walkthrough if we were actually stuck. Um, we didn't like to to do everything sentence by sentence from the walkthrough but uh yeah that takes some of the fun out of it really if you yeah know. definitely yes you know i feel like uh, those games can make you feel like a genius hmm. <laughs> like oh yeah. i figured this out oh i'm so smart <laughs> yeah but that feeling is what you're going for for in a game i, I think uh, when when you get that feeling then they they made a good game um I'm playing games for fun and not because yeah. I struggle or get frustrated. <laughs> I remember, I saw, I think I saw Mist and all those games in, in your collection too. Mm-hmm. Those are some I'd be playing those. My wife would be playing them with me and we'd just get stuck on something and just spend like all day. But then you'd go to sleep mm. like about three or four in the morning. You'd wake up like, oh my God. That's what I have to do. <laughs> yes. I know what to do. You know, wake yeah. up. I mean, it's just, it's good times. It's kind of excitement that you just don't get with other genres. It's hard to describe, but true, true. And that's basically why I like adventure gaming so much because of the story. Um, it's sort of like reading a book, but then you are the main character. You get to make the decisions. Uh, sort of that that thing, and it's more visual. I'm a bit dyslectic, so uh, reading has always been a hassle for me. So getting these these video these cinematics, um, yeah, it really helps me out, and uh, that's perfect. So I know you like Day of the Tentacle. I think you also had said that there's a yeah there's a seventh guest book box. Yes, is I think yeah. I'm curious about. there is. Uh, I don't have it with me. Uh, I do have a lot of stuff around me, but not a not a seventh guest uh, box book box. Um, but yeah, the, you have like these, when you're collecting these box PC games, you're always, um, the, the question is like, what's your favorite? What's your favorite box? What's your favorite box art? Uh, these questions get asked a lot. Um, and then you, of course, start to wonder yourself. Um, so as, as in box wise, um, so like the shape of the box, I think my favorite, um, it, it might be the, the, clockwork box from the the 11th hour um which is like when you open the box uh to get the cd out um it sort of opens like a gear of a clock uh, which is really amazing and also this arm that that moves up to 11th hour hour. yeah i don't know do you have that one on your uh yeah it's in the in my uh, cabinet oh not on this one um but on the in the panorama picture um 
Uh, let's see. I don't. And then all the way to the. Well, I got that one. Right. All the way to the right. The last cabinet. All the way. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's hard. Oh work. yeah, I see it there. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Seed too. That's a good. Yeah. So those are that's the cabinet with all the shaped boxes, like with different shapes. Um, and there's indeed the, the clockwork box, but also the seven guest box that you mentioned, like the book shape. Uh, and when you open up the page, you see like um, an illusion of, of three doors. And when you open the door at the back, uh, there's a VHS tape behind it with the making off of the game, which is really <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I guess you probably watched the tape. I have, yes, uh, multiple times. And it's it's really exciting. It's because The Seventh Guest is it's quite a unique game. It's sort of together with Myst. It was one of those first games on a CD. Yeah. Uh, so they were those were the, the games that were able to um, have a lot of big files on there. Uh, and they really extended it to the max. Uh, even that much that the CD got full as well, that they even have to remove some stuff to make it fit. But yeah, rendered video that was that was big back then. I love talking to the fat man. Mm. I don't know if you ever met him, George George Sanger? I haven't met him. I I know him as in uh, seen pictures, seen videos, but oh, he's a character. Never spoke to him. <laughs> amazing, uh, yeah, that amazing character. Yeah. Really, they could have really good music on on a game because they had that storage. Yeah. Well, the, the seventh guess that music is really really good. I think there's something special about that stone keep game there too, right? The... Yeah, it's like a like a gravestone shape. So oh. you have like the, the base and then the stone on it. It's really good. And also all the way at the top, you have this uh, creature shock with uh, where the CD is the eye of the creature. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, those are these are really good good designs. Oh my um, god. And then there is the, the June box uh, where you have like this, when you fold it open, you have the mouth of the sandworm that, that opens and closes, which is really great. Oh, that's just, you know, that, that really shows you the, the creativity. Yes. That people yes. put into game boxes. I mean, wow. And ultra bots as well. That, that's like a, like a machine part that can move like a machine part. <laughs> you can that's sort of like open it and close it and fold it and... Yeah, like the it's... Wing Commander comes in like a tape reel, an old school like movie reel box canister. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, that is so cool. Those are those are good things, and so that's that's about the shape. One of my favorites. Um, of course, there's the art on the box. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, the art of Steve Purcell from the Monkey Island games, uh, one and two. Uh, he did also uh, Sam and Max, uh, the cover art. Um, there's of course the the Doom cover. I love the Doom cover. And yeah, there's uh, the salmon. Well, there's the. Oh yeah, that's the also where the Salmon Max game is. And you see also a, a handmade drawing next to it, uh, made by Steve Purcell for uh, for me. Really? Wow. Yes, that's really stunning. Like oh. a Salmon Max and this little sentence about, uh, well, something about my collection. Uh, what a great collection you have there something like pc king great collection yeah, yeah. i bet they're you know a lot of the developers i've talked to they didn't even keep the stuff themselves hmm. you know, so they don't have a box you know they're like well we didn't think anybody would care about this game you know <laughs> last like a year or two and then everybody forgets about it so yeah <laughs> it must be, that... must be really nice as a developer to look oh this you know it's still out there this guy's collecting these things yes yeah you still hear it often then um I'm also focusing these latest years a bit more on Dutch games because I'm a Dutch guy, of course. Um, you get to sort of uh, get interested to, uh, about the history of the Dutch game industry. Um, and you see a lot of these companies that don't preserve their own history. Yeah. So they make a game and then they move on to the next game, but they don't archive what they made. And that's sort of sad to see that you see their their own collection sort of being get lost and yeah it happens a lot actually and i was kind of surprised by that yeah it's good to find people there's a few out there mm. uh, i mean lord british comes to mind as somebody that really collects ah yes yeah but also other things aside from from game their own uh, games it's also a collector of many other uh 
nice artifacts, so to speak, <laughs> awesome. which I can really appreciate. You had a uh, John Romero's broken keyboard. <laughs> yes. That? Yeah, there is a, there it is. Let me show that. That's fun. Yeah, that's good stuff. Um, that's why sure, sure, we go. Yeah. And the kind of actually, it's a pretty fun story as well. Um, so it started out that uh, Brenda Romero posted a picture of this broken keyboard um, and that it had been broken by, by John while he was playing a Quake game. Yeah, uh, I could so see him doing that too. <laughs> and then he lost and he was so angry that he that he mashed his uh, his keyboard multiple times and, uh, and yeah, it, it broke. <laughs> um, and then a, a few... I think a few days later that he, um, Brenda Romero posted another picture of that keyboard hanging uh, on a wall in their, in their house. Uh, <laughs> so now it's like an art piece. Um, wow. And I sort, of, I sort of thought like, yeah, it, well, why not make it an art piece? So I, I asked Brenda if, uh, if it would be nice to have that uh, in, the, in the museum uh, in the Netherlands in my uh, collection. Um, and she was sort of, yeah, see, it was it was a nice, uh, exciting idea to 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 do that. So we make that happen, and uh, they send it to me. Uh, it was also signed by John Romero and even the the guy who beat him with Quake, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is pretty funny. And uh, some some uh, loose keys were coming with it as well. That is so fun. Yeah, and later there was even an uh, an eBay auction of another keyboard that he broke. Uh, he probably got he, thousands of broken keyboards. <laughs> well, it was there was the second uh, keyboard that he broke where the public got known about it, uh, and he also said in a sentence, "Yeah, my, the last time I broke a keyboard, it went to a museum." <laughs> so I wonder like, what else. You think he's ever broke a monitor? That might be. <laughs> yeah, I also I really also broke a table once. <laughs> broke the table. <laughs> yeah. Let me uh, on a little bit about this uh, this museum. You know, how'd that get get off the ground? Um. Did well, was, for people like, oh my god, that's not a. You know, this is a problem. I, I don't know about so much now, but you know, when I was just starting out with this stuff, you know, yeah, like writing and studying, people were like video games. It's not important. That's just you know a pastime, a hobby. You know, that's not serious. Yeah, when I when I started with yeah. collecting box PC games, I I sort of knew already that I was going all the way, that I was going for it, you know, collecting big time, um, and it was always my intention to share it with the world, uh, never to keep it in cabinets uh, or stored away or let it collect dust. I always wanted to show it to the people, and um, when I uh, had about think 250 games or so 200 250 games um i met um the, the person who owned the largest collection in the netherlands of box pc games uh, which made me really excited and i uh, he, he, i was a big fan of him and um i got to to talk to him as well and we 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 spoke on on monthly basis um and later a few years later he passed away um and that's uh yeah that was a, a big um yeah there, there was there was i i really lost a, a big connection there in the in the gaming world um and his his collection um yeah eventually i ended up uh, buying this collection from uh, uh from his sons um, but uh, the collection went to his sons, and I got to uh, got an offer for this. Uh, I gave an offer for their games, and uh, I was able to get them. Um, and then I was like, "This this needs to be seen by people." Uh, so I, I, that was the moment where I got well, my collection grew like three times as big that it, as what it was before. Um, so that was a moment that I realized, yeah, I, this is the moment to to find a location where, where people can see it. And um, I, there, was, there weren't many places in the Netherlands where you could go to. There was only, at that time, one uh, computer game museum, and that was the, the Bonami Games and Computers Museum. And that, uh, that moment, it was in Ape. We got in contact. Um, Ape is a place in the Netherlands. And 
later they moved to Zwolle and then they moved to a bigger location. And that was the moment where we sort of decided that I could join in with my collection and exhibit it there, uh, which was really exciting for me. And uh, that's also the picture you got behind you now uh, that's uh, taken there in, in Zwolle in the museum. Um, but it always felt like it, it was a bit off. It didn't really belong there in that museum. Um, and then, then it, was, it was like a few years, I think in maybe two or three years time, uh, the Netherlands became like a computer game Valhalla, uh, like multiple museums were opening up, uh, a lot of arcade uh, uh, places that were opening up and it sort of like exploded all of a sudden with retro games. And uh, when you visit the Netherlands nowadays, you have some extremely good places to visit to to get all your i've got to go there yeah definitely definitely um yeah, there's like the national video game museum in soutemir there's now the home computer museum in helmond uh, where my collection is now of course there's the bonami Spell computer museum um so much so much more to to see um what kind of people go to visit the museum i think um, in Helmond, where my collection is now, it's mostly like the home computer, like the history of the home computer. And what I love about that museum is that it's it it looks really good. They really made it like um, a beautiful display to to look at. Not only my collection, but also the computers as well. Mm -hmm. You have like this whole background, all the the furniture uh, is from that time period. So uh, like a little lamp, a little uh, ghetto blaster, uh, a, a Coke, Coca-Cola cap on there that, that makes it fit really like that time period. Uh, also the, the, the wallpaper on the back, is, uh, it's, it's all perfectly in match, it, it aligned with that time period, which is amazing to, to like see, you really get back in time. Like a time machine or something, right? Yes, yes. And you start from back, in time and you go all the way to more of more recent times so to speak um, i really did, a, did an amazing job there that sounds so awesome mm. i bet for you i know for me the half of the fun would be you'd be hoping there'd be some other people there because you could like <laughs> you know get into conversations about all these things and point out definitely the, well these stuff. museums they they open up uh a lot of these moments where people go there and you can have people to talk with them. Uh, so it's, it's always good to, when there are visitors, uh, a lot of them really like to talk about their past and their nostalgic feeling about these things. Uh, so yeah, getting a conversation with a, a person you don't know about this good old, about the good old days, that's, that's really, yeah, that, that happens a lot and uh, it's a good feeling. Now, let's see some of these. I got a lot of questions. You know, people were really excited when I told them I was going to talk to you and they, they took a look at the collection. Of, <laughs> you know, like you say, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, what's the first one? What's what's your favorite? You know, that, that's mm -hmm. the thing. Uh, <clears throat> a couple of you, I think we maybe we touched on this a little bit already. Uh, but Matt Shergi had asked about this. My assistant, uh, assistant producer, he was asking about the how do you think the physical packaging, the manuals, and the all the feelies? You know, we saw some. You know, the feelies are just little objects, right? Ah, yes. So, how did that contribute to computer games in a way that you just don't get with the digital release? I mean, yeah, you could buy it on Steam; it's, mm -hmm. it's easy, but aren't you missing out on something? Well, hell yes. Uh, <laughs> when you, of course, <laughs> buying a copy, like a physical copy, is like you you sort of um have something tangible that you can i don't know it it, it takes you more into this game world uh, when you only have a copy of like only have a digital copy of the game um you have this computer and you the the world starts when you press play mm -hmm. um, but with a physical copy it starts before that it gets already you get already sucked in this world um, before that. And I mean, um, I personally, of course, prefer that to have a physical thing to, to look at and, and read about it and see the, uh, the feelings inside. Um, 
and there are also so gamers that um that don't have much feel with it and that's that's fine by me i mean uh, i don't judge uh it's just for, for me i really like to have this physical medium that, and all these extra goodies inside um because it sort of extends the world and makes it more uh connect with your world <laughs> your daily world yeah. i uh, i think um yeah it's like this this world on this disc is actually real or something like that because of these little extra things that take you in inside that world so i think that's amazing and especially like yeah like i said my favorite is hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy um which has like i think maybe six or seven little feelies inside um which is stunning but yeah a lot of these games even if it's just a mouse pad or or a t-shirt uh, or a poster that already is exciting but sometimes they go uh, a, a bit further and then um yeah that 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 really helps you um i don't know it it it, it makes my heart beat faster just to to look at it and sometimes it's really original what they do and when i i love games being original um yeah something that is so lost on today's market i mean almost there's everything's a sequel you know everything like oh, <laughs> number 12 yeah. of the series <laughs> yeah i was looking yeah, for that or, or a remastered version of it uh just because they're out of creativity i think and just trying to milk it yeah so often yeah, and, but one of my i know exactly what you're talking about one time, I don't remember, I think it was my birthday or maybe it was Christmas, but, you know, one of those holidays. Yeah, mm -hmm. games were expensive enough. I didn't just, when I was a kid, you know, I was doing good to get like one for my birthday, one one for Christmas. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, my, uh, my grandmother was, uh, she bought me a copy of Pool of Radiance. Radius. Pool of Radiance. Oh, Pool of Radiance. Oh, sorry. Yes. With the, the yeah. sort of dragon on the front, the red dragon or something. Yeah, I got it up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, oh, that one. I mean, sorry, yes, I'm, I mean, you know, I was saying, uh, I told you that you know, these games are complicated, Memo. You know, I need to, I need to open this box and like get the manuals and you know, read it so that when my birthday comes, I can just jump in, into playing. It. And she, she agreed, but my birthday was quite a ways off, <laughs> <laughs> so I just like you know, reading over and over these. I was even like fascinated by this code wheel, you know, I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. that's, that's cool. and the journal, you know, you're reading all this stuff and like the excitement Definitely. You know, builds up and you're like, oh, God, I yeah. can't wait to play this, you know, but all would have been, all that would have been lost if I just downloaded it. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's something that, um, I don't know, there's just another part to it that, um, that makes me want to have a physical copy and that's also when, like for example, a Steam library, when steam decides to stop then you lose all the games yes um it's like from a historical value and like an archive uh yeah it's, it's sort of all of all get lost at that moment and with a physical thing uh, even though if it's digitalized it helps of course when it's you have a digital copy of something that you can play um the, like the internet archive uh, is, is a place where you can also find uh, a lot of these old games, and I really love that there that there, that there's someone out there doing that, uh, having this archive, and where all these uh, yeah pieces of history get sort of stored and archived uh, and preserved, um, which is uh, something that that definitely needs to be done if you want to keep uh, keep being able to play those games. Absolutely, I mean you're doing a, a really yeah. important work of you know, video game preservation. Yeah, I know a lot. Like a lot of people talk, uh, like the film history professors I work with, and mm. like that they really mourn. They're like, you know, all this early stuff just got disposed of. We don't have act. We know you read about it, <laughs> you hear mm -hmm. descriptions of it, but it's all gone now. Yeah. Like the, the BBC got rid of a bunch of like Doctor Who uh, reels and things. I mean, like Doctor Who, really? Somebody thought that was not important enough to like save. Mm -hmm. yeah there's you none know, just gone yeah or they or they just don't know that someone that, that nobody is saving it i mean you sort of would think that it 
that there's always someone out there yeah. preserving it or saving it but yeah who who did we all agree on who that person is and uh, <laughs> i mean where can we go <laughs> i thought it was you i thought it was i thought you yeah were exactly you. oh weren't you the, supposed to do that <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, think right. part of it, maybe even more so than in like movies and, and music. Mm. Some somewhat with music, but ever I think even more with games. Yeah, you, know, you got like a record player, as those go out of, you know, then they got the tapes and then you got the CDs and people like, well, I don't need these tapes anymore, you know, now that mm. we got CDs. But I think it's even more so with especially with consoles, right? <laughs> it's like yeah. who wants to play regular Nintendo games anymore? Now we got the Super Nintendo. <laughs> like they're all anybody cares about is like, what is brand spanking new you know what's coming up and you know, just yeah. so quickly just uh, forget about this other stuff yeah yeah one example i had uh, like scott pilgrim versus the world was one of those games that i was excited about and i loved it um a little fighter game and then uh, all of a sudden it went out of the stores and you weren't able to buy it anymore and it was not playable anywhere mm -hmm. um, and then thanks to uh, limited run games, uh, they decided to make it a, a physical copy again, so you could play it again, which I really love. Uh, one of the, I have to say this, one of the exceptions uh, when I'm positive about limited run games, uh, I have to say, um, because often they just uh, try to uh, make a lot of money out of games that already exist uh, just by milking it another time. Um, so <laughs> there is this. Uh, there are some games out there, limited run games, that are doing a good job because else you wouldn't be able to play it. And that's what I like about it that they sort of preserve it in a, in a way and make it more. Um, um, how do you say it? More possible for you to to play. More accessible. Uh, more accessible. That's the word. And. But on the other hand, uh, like for example, Monkey Island, uh, well, uh, and well, maybe other a, a lot of these LucasArts games, they all came out on limited run in a new kind of box thing. Um, I'm not so excited about that. I was wondering, what do you think about these, like the Kickstarters and the hmm. the figs and all those? They'll do like the the super, they call them like the collector's edition. Mm -hmm. Always a little bit. I don't know how to feel about this, that sort of thing, because I'm like, you know, how can somebody already want a collector's edition of a game they've never even played before? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I don't know how you feel about it. Yeah, a bit the same. Um, I had this with, um, and I you have this with this LucasArts games. I had it because LucasArts games are always has always been my favorite in a way, and uh, there was this. If Monkey Island, they have the tentacle, and then they sort of remastered it, and I was like, okay, that's that's good in a way because like the new generation of gamers haven't played that game yet, and it's now more accessible to play it now, and with newer graphics, which is good. I mean, not everybody likes pixels like me, um, so it's a uh, uh, yeah, I think it's a step up, but then um, it sort of gets pushed into this um, milking machine to make as much out of it as possible. And that's, yeah, that's sort of not a thing for me. Then, then I draw a line there and say, no, that's not for me. Yeah, that's a really good example too, because you know, like with the games with those really gorgeous pixel art and the, you know, the sprite-based art, to me, those are really good. Mm. You know, I just, I love like, just like you, you know, I like the pixels, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's arch, you know, just, you know, something special about it. These were like the people that were at absolute top of the game artists in that, that medium. Mm -hmm. You know, it's almost like colorizing an old black and white movie, right? You got the gorgeous yes. black and white. You don't want a colorized version of that. It sucks. No, you want the original. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to just say, well, we'll get the pixels are old, you know, we'll, we'll redo it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think the redo in it is going to make a better exactly let's let's make a picture a, a better picture of the mona lisa or something like that <laughs> like, uh, it's sharper now <laughs> that's yeah, not how it works it is. yeah <laughs> get out of town <laughs> but that's uh but then again there's the other side of, of uh games for example um shanty it was a game board color game um that i really wanted but wasn't able to buy because it was it's like maybe 
like only the cartridge is like four hundred dollars now or so, um, which is extremely expensive. Wow! But I really I I want to play the games because they're good, uh, not because they're rare or expensive. I want to play them because they're good. And this game I really wanted to play, but I do want to play them in an original way. I don't want to have uh, I don't want to play it on an emulator. Uh, mm-hmm. And I don't want to play a, a copy. I don't know. It, it, it doesn't feel right. When I play a game, I want to play the original on the original hardware. And also with Duke Island, I want to play the pixel version, not the remastered version. And uh, But then Limited Run Games came out with Shanty uh, with a new release, um, which is almost like an exact copy of the original one. Um, but instead of Game Boy, it's at Limited Run Games. And that's basically the, the only difference. And then I'm, I'm like very positive because then I'm, uh, I'm able to play that game and in an original way um, because it's an original release and it's got the box and everything. And then, then it feels all right with me, so to speak. So that, that makes me happy. Um, but yeah, there, there, are, there are different, um, different approaches and different ways that I look at it. Or different situations, yeah. I really like what Nintendo's been doing lately with their online store, whatever they call that, where you can buy the controllers. Mm. They got the NES, it's pretty much an NES controller, but you can play it with a Switch. And I just got the order the Nintendo 64 ones. All right, all right. Yeah, you notice such a big difference. Have you ever tried to play something like Ocarina of Time in an emulator? You know, uh, yeah, well, I have to play so Ocarina of Time. Doesn't. Just, on, a, on a Game Boy, you have the DS version of Ocarina of Time, but that's yeah. just not it for me. I want to play it on the original hardware, like yes, N64. Well, the, the control scheme, the controllers, that's part of the experience. I mean, yeah, yeah. You know, that's what they designed it. They had that scheme in mind, absolutely, mm-hmm. when then it's optimized for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's something that for me as well, uh, that's why I, I, I think I'm very lucky that I got very early on uh, started collecting uh, because I was able to get all these games that I wanted to play. For me, it's like uh, maybe um, 70% PC and 30% console, but I got the good games for a console. So that's uh, got everything I need here. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was because of I, because that I started early and none of that would have been possible if I started later on. Well, let me ask you about this because, you know, I've, I've got some stuff I'm collecting, too, and I try to do my the best I can, but, you know, I'm mm-hmm. obviously an amateur. <laughs> oh, no, of course. I like, mean, uh, I want your advice. So, you know, how do you put together a really good shelf, you know, a really good display? Do you mm-hmm. have advice about, like, how to position things and, and how to group things together and even, like, things like lighting? And is there a certain kind of case I noticed the one uh, that I have and the, behind me here has got glass on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like plexiglass. So what, is, what is just your advice as far as not just the collecting, you know, we kind of talked but like displaying it effectively? Mm-hmm. Well, um, I started out with collecting almost everything. Um, and what I changed in time is sort of focus more on uh on what I want to display and what I want, what story do I want to tell in a museum? Mm. So I got more focus on those games, and uh, and only when when I get donations, they sometimes get added to my collection. But uh, otherwise, I wouldn't buy them that that uh, quickly anymore. Um, so that that is a, a big difference in uh, my scope is is uh, fine tuned, and that makes it in a way that what you have in your collection is more special and is part of that story that you want to tell. Mm -hmm. So that helps on what you display. Um, As for cabinets, I started out with, like, this is also a fun story. You know, of course, this panorama that you have behind you, uh, there's of course the second panorama, but there was also one before that. And this panorama, started because I was looking at uh, on the internet for people um, with large box PC game collections, like as big as mine or maybe bigger. I wanted to figure out where do I stand with my collection? 
Um, I had around, what was it? Around maybe 800 box PC games back then, um, 900. And all of a sudden I found a picture on the internet and I was stunned. My mind was blown. I saw this, all these uh, cabinets filled with box PC games back to back and my mouth fell open. This was the biggest collection I'd ever seen. And it also said there that it was, this is the biggest collection of box PC games in the world. Um, and I, I got really excited. I mean, this, is, this was not a collector like me who was collecting the same thing. And then I started looking at these cabinets and looking and counting these boxes. And I was like, wait a minute, I have twice as much. <laughs> I've easily twice as much even. Uh, so, but all my games were in banana boxes back then in the storage at that, at that point. Mm -hmm. So I was never able to, to display it that way. So that's when I thought, all right, I need to, I need to display it. I need to, to put it together, even if it's just for a picture. Um, so I made that happen in a weekend. So in one weekend, I put all these cabinets, uh, um, at my work, we, we emptied all the cabinets for my work and then put all the boxes in there, made a picture, and then I had to tear it all down again, put wow. it back in the banana boxes. But this picture was so worth it. And that was only all my games back to back. Um, and then I figured out that Billy's were like the, the cabinets I have right there for me, for my Kia that worked pretty well. But of course, there's no glass in front of it. So I wanted to because I wanted to display them publicly, I needed something in front of it. Um, and the solution from the, when I got in contact with the museum where I wanted to display them, um, the, the picture that is behind you, that's the second panorama picture. This is the third one uh, that is now uh, on my screen at least. <laughs> um, All the one behind me. Yeah, the one behind you, yes. That's um, that's like more like a storage cabinets and with plexiglass in front, like bolted in there. And that it worked, but it didn't have the look that I wanted it to have. Also this plexiglass sort of reflected a lot of light. So you can really see. I can see the person well. taking the picture. You look really close. <laughs> yeah, that's me. <laughs> oh, that is you there. Yeah, that is me. Yeah, on every cabinet you see me, 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 me. <laughs> <laughs> like your watermark <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah a little bit yes <laughs> unintentionally um but yeah like the, these the plexiglass was reflecting a lot and these cabinets um they weren't they, they didn't have this i would say this this beauty to it it was just there because it was cheaper um and i needed uh, i needed shelves to put them on so that was that was the solution of the museum to to being able to display it, which was fine. But then, uh, of course, uh, I found out about Helmond, the home computer museum in Helmond in the Netherlands. And when they opened up, uh, that museum was like a home computer museum, and my games were uh, games who were meant to be played on home computers. So it felt like this is the place where my games uh, really f fit in well. So I got in contact and um, was able to display them there. And they wanted to make it, they wanted to make it look good. Um, so they invested in like these really good museum cabinets with actual glass. Is that the uh, one that we were looking at here? Yes, that's the the final one. Um, oh, this is... and it's, you see it in a row now, but it's actually a room. So it goes around corners uh, and there's also a little island. Oh, this broken keyboard again. Yes, there it is. <laughs> so it's now on display in another museum, the keyboard. So it's it's not here uh, in uh, Helmond anymore. It's now in Hilversum in the Sound and Vision Museum. So I often have uh, exhibitions. And uh, the keyboard is now displayed in another museum. I mean, yeah. I don't know if people just look at this stuff. They might not realize it, but, you know, as somebody who's tried to do this <laughs> himself you know, you know i can tell you it, it takes a lot of effort to just line up everything right and you know exactly. get the right angles i mean there's a whole lot of work to this this is definitely a lot of work and not only that because it's also um in what order do you show them and that has been so difficult for me i, I can explain it but it's still hard to grasp uh, how how this is ordered because no, i wanted to yeah, i wanted yeah. to sort of order it alphabetically um on a developer 
So you get like uh, uh, 3D realms first and then seventh level uh, and then later you get Epigee and then Blizzard and et cetera, et cetera. Kind of a chronological uh, thing. Sorry? Kind of a chron- chronology of games almost from... Yeah, exactly. And then, to the... So I wanted to display it in alphabetical order and then make sort of groups of it. But there is... Uh, you can also always put the boxes back to back, but then uh, it doesn't look as nice as you see a couple of uh, boxes when you see the front cover. So I wanted to have these uh, one shelf, the the top shelf to be back to back, which uh, didn't happen in all the shelves, as you can see. Um, But uh, then the the second, third and fourth um, shelf to be like, displaying the cover art and then the fifth and sixth uh, shelf to be back to back again but then you when you realize that you wanted to display i wanted to display this part and i wanted to display that part but i don't want to display that part because that's lesser known uh, so i wanted to display prince of persia i wanted to display mist uh, tomb raider elites mortal Kombat, need for speed like the, the games that everybody knows i wanted to display those and, but then it sort of shifts the alphabetical order a bit. So in the middle three rows, you have an alphabetical order, but also the top and the bottom row have also an alphabetical order, which is slightly, um, yeah, slightly different. So that makes it a bit difficult sometimes to, um, to figure out where to find a game when you're looking at the alphabet. I mean, I could see some advantages to having a little bit of almost randomness to this because it makes you want to look at the whole collection instead of just zooming right to the one part, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And also there is a computer there as well in the museum where you can just type in the title and it tells you on which shelf it is. So (laughs) that's pretty cool. What is this elite thing? I don't know if you, can you see this? Yeah. What is the, that? It's like a record or something to the left. Of oh the, no, it's a box. It's a box. It just the angle is a bit weird, but it's a it's a normal box like the others. It's a Elite Plus. Oh, that's what that is. It's a little, a little small. I want to get that. I'm mm-hmm. a big Elite fan. I've got <laughs> some of this stuff. I'm really excited about. Uh, I don't have the, Elite uh, Plus in my collection. I I got to rectify that error. <laughs> I'm most excited about the Commodore 64 version because they made it all fit on a cassette tape, which is mind blowing to me. Like all these 200 and what is it? 55 planets that you can fly through in 3D in real time on a cassette tape. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, you must get people coming here that are, their minds will be blown just by like, what? A tape? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's difficult for um, the newer generations um, because they're all playing uh, Fortnite, Roblox, and uh, Minecraft. Um, so it's hard to, to make them realize that there's a world before that. <laughs> I see you got some, uh, sometimes you'll have the discs. Mm-hmm as part of it yeah yeah it, make, it makes it more tangible uh to make people realize that they're actually on a on a diskette instead of a cd-rom or that there were different times um it's good to show that every once in a while you you see the medium where the games were put on yeah the limitations of those but also the what is that sword there Oh, that's that's nothing special. That's just a sword to make it. Uh, I wanted to have the the rubber chicken with the pulley in the middle. Uh, <laughs> of course, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I have the rubber chicken. I just have to add a pulley to it, but that's uh, for future times. Wow, this is just amazing. Yeah, I could spend all day long pissed. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes the parody games <laughs> yes those are all it's a complete collection of all the parody games there are four of, there are four of them so oh there's your gold box or black get some black box games there yeah, yeah i don't have that much gold boxes and i have um and also the, the eye of the beholder i have all three but uh, this is an old picture <laughs> so the second one uh, has to be added here as well and of course seventh gas cannon fodder that's a good Oh yes. The, you played the Amiga version of that, or 
old PC. We old, didn't have an Amiga. I didn't even know someone with an Amiga, so I only got the PC. Uh, I know it's more like an Amiga version. Uh, that's uh, the same counts for Worms and Lemmings. It's it's started on Amiga, but still, uh, I played it on PC, and that's how I got to know them. EverQuest, yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Oh wow. Good times. I was more like uh, Blues Brothers is one of your favorites, isn't it? Yes. When you when you think of, I think gameplay, but also music is sometimes part of your your feel with the game. And the Blues Brothers just definitely uh, is, gives you a good feeling when you're playing. It's the music is good and um, the gameplay is so smooth and it's just pretty easy. You just have you walk, you jump, and you pick up a crate and throw a crate. That's mostly it. So uh, it's pretty easy, but it, the, the the graphics are so beautiful. Uh, that goes for a lot of Titus games. They're, they're they have these amazing graphics, um, smooth gameplay, good music, and maybe not so much of a story, but it, it follows the story of the film, the, the movie, a little bit. Um, so not that you have to gather the people, but the instruments <laughs> uh, and the contract. But yeah, I love that game. And it's also one of those games that I play every once in a while. And like, as in once every half a year, I just start that game just for fun. Um, the same goes for Prince of Persia. Kind of a comfort game. Hmm. Yes. So I was thinking of that. You know, people get so fixated on like, well, does, does, the, does the game have this, does it have a great elaborate storyline? You know, is it graphics and all this stuff? But But for me, it's... You know, like you say, there's certain games that just give you, they put you in a certain mood. Mm. Yeah, the exactly. feeling that you get playing the game, it's very hard to describe, but yeah, you know, you just can't, you can't buy that, you know? No, exactly. <laughs> uh, when you find the right games, then it, it helps a lot with, uh, with getting you in the mood and, and yeah, just enjoying yourself, having a good time. And uh, another game that, that really works for me is uh, Dungeon Keeper. Oh, sure, sure. Oh, man, that's such a good... And especially the first one. I'm not so much a big fan of the second one. But the first one is so good. Um, I was really blown away by how much is how much love is put into that game. Um, it, when you just do... First of all, you're, you're evil instead of good, uh, which is a nice twist. Um, not that I want to be evil, but hey, it gives you the opportunity at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, whatever you feel like, you can. Um, black and white has the same uh, same thing to it. Uh, and there's always the, the we know that there is a link between those games, of course. Um, but yeah, like Dungeon Keeper, it, you play evil and you get to just grab your minions and put them where you want them. You smack them if they don't don't do their work well. <laughs> Uh, and you build your own dungeon. Um, and there's always a, a sense of seriousness to the game as well, which I which I appreciate so much in many games. Um, like there's not this, this, not this Hollywood hum- humor that you see in a lot of games, not this over the top kind of thing, but more like a seriousness to it that it could almost like it could actually have happened or so, like in, in a way that it's... Um, it's in in it it plays in your world, so to speak. So it, it could happen like underground in your own world. Um, of course, there's a little little touches like magic and stuff like that. Um, but it's it's yeah, think it's hard to describe that. the seriousness. Yeah, perfect, it makes perfect sense to me that you would like Dungeon Keeper because you know you <laughs> like building environments for people to come in and explore, right? And yeah, yeah, it's like your personality. <laughs> and there, there are even there, there's not one but two cherries on top for me with Dungeon Keeper as well. One of them is being able to cast a spell on your creature to make you look out of their eyes, so oh. you can walk through your own made dungeon, um, complete with their way of seeing things like these these bugs they have different kind of few like more of a, a fish eye kind of look on it um or maybe with segments um and with flies you can fly through the air and minions can only walk like these imps but any imps you can you can mine your gold and when you're looking out of their eyes you are even a bit faster with mining gold so that helps there's a little trick there but that that blew my mind that you could not only top down manage everything, but also 
it, it, you make a light, like a complete different game out of it when you just um, go under the skin of one of your creatures, one of your minions. This is really insane to me. Um, and also the other cherry on top was, uh, or is the the Easter egg that they put in. I mean, I love Easter eggs in games, and Lucas Arts has a lot of them. Um, but Dungeon Keeper, those are my favorite Easter eggs ever. One of them is uh, when you play the game when it's an actual full moon outside, you get extra levels that you can play, like sort of bonus levels. Uh. Uh, so that's really, really nice touch to them. Um, where they, yeah, you just look outside when you have a full moon, you get extra levels. It's, it's really nice, uh, nicely done. And also one of them, when you have an old printer hooked up to your computer um, and you start to play like level five and up, your enemy starts to taunt, to taunt you uh, via your printer. So he sent you <laughs> messages. And that is so yeah. insane. And I, I love that so much. So yeah, those are the Easter eggs that really do it for me. Oh, that is so cool. Yes, it's insane and beautiful. So yes, I love that so much. Well, and speaking of that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, this this it, uh, this seriousness is is something that um, that was taken away in the in the second part of Dungeon Keeper. Uh, it got more like uh, slapstick humor, and uh, and also the gameplay suffered from it. The graphics sort of suffered from it as well. Um, and like you have also this main character, uh, we we call him Horny, but the Horned Reaper, of course. Um, He's like this badass creature that you very rarely you, you can create him in the temple when you put you sacrifice different creatures in the temple you get the horn creeper and you have to sort of keep an extra uh, separate room for him uh, because else he would be killing all your other creatures when he's angry and he gets angry pretty sad, pretty quick um, but in the first game he's like this really badass character that's really overpowered but you have to really manage his um, his environment but in the second game it's just like an, an kill finisher like you when you finish the game you just press the horned reaper button and he just grabs the diamond there's no not much action there mm. which i really think is a, is a really missed opportunity there you can always tell the difference when a when a developer is just kind of doing their own thing and they're making the game that they would want to play and mm. it's almost like a special relationship with the gamer you know you feel really close it's again hard to describe it but there's such a big difference in that kind of game and then something that was you could tell they're just going for the biggest possible audience and they're trying to bring in everybody yeah. <laughs> you know non yeah. and it just doesn't ever really work out it depends on their view in the indeed when when they're creating a game are they going for it for the money or for their passion of creating what's in their heart and that difference is uh, is visible yeah yes yeah, like here's the little world that i created and it's <laughs> it's enjoyable <laughs> for you to explore i got it you know speaking of dungeon keeper i wanted to you know touch on some questions i got from tired uh, gaming dad hmm. i think this is related to dungeon keeper in a way <laughs> Bring it. I was uh, asking about. Well, there's two questions I think are kind of related. One, you know, how do you protect these these games? Mm -hmm. How do you protect your collection? And what kind of uh, mechanisms do you have? Do you make backups of, of discs and physical media, you know, just in case there is some kind of horrific <laughs> failure, or natural disaster, or something. Yeah, well, there is like two two kinds of protection in this case. Of course, there's this physical protection and the digital protection. Um, physically, it's uh, it's it's having the right cabinets. Uh, well, with at first uh, with a lock on them, but also the museum has um, has like this UV um, blocking glass, uh, which helps. Um, but also covering up these these cabinets uh, make them less dusty. Uh, which helps and take care of the the humidity in the rooms. Uh, make sure that it doesn't get too humid. How do you say? <laughs> okay. um, to to well, 
You know, if you got all your collection down in the basement, it might get kind of humid and damp. I mean, like mold. You don't want mold. You don't want mold on your games. Uh, no. It expands and it, it destroys it. Uh, and also sunlight is one of the things that you really have to take care of. So that is something uh, you definitely should, should look at. Um, digitally, uh, the way I look at it, it's mostly... Uh, of course, I would like to preserve everything uh, and digitalize everything and make everything uh, playable for everyone. Uh, but there are already groups that do that, um, that make that preserve it. Um, you have, of course, Steam and GOG where you could uh, play old games. Uh, there's also other things like ExoDOS. I'm not sure if you heard of it. Uh, sometimes it's like the, it's just like. Uh, a whole bundle of these games um, preserved in a way that they that they have this uh, installation ready on the go. So when you when you start it, um, it plays exactly what like you want it to. Um, so they make it they they keep it playable in a way. Mm -hmm. And what I look at in my collection is games that aren't preserved yet in a way like that that can be found on the internet. So if you look at it and you see it nowhere. Then I try to digitalize that and make uh, and preserve that in a way. Um, in the future, I'd like to uh, try and preserve it also more, like with the Internet Archive. Try to make it more accessible for other people. Um, at the moment, I just have a, like a personal archive most of the time. I did edit some uh, some games to the archive um, that I thought were worth it. Also, you have Moby Games where you can show what content is in there or how what the uh, the, the look of the box the, um, the cover art and stuff like that so I, I add to that um but only when i think it doesn't exist yet and there aren't many games that uh that i can't find information about on the internet uh, mm -hmm. i do find it a lot with the dutch games so in my Dutch game collection, there are a lot of games that are not preserved yet. Uh, so I try to uh, to put effort in that and make that happen. So yeah, that that helps. Um, sure. Was one of them is uh, I'm a big fan of the Red Cat series, and it's like a, a Dutch game. It's in Dutch language, and it's an educational series. It's fun when you're you're. Uh, for us, it's more like a cult game at the moment. We all grew up with Red Cat. Uh, it was like a game that was played in schools where you could... What's, what's it called? Red Cat. So like a Red Cat. Uh, like R-A-D? Red Cats? Red Cat. Red as in the color and cat as in... Oh, Red Cat. <laughs> and then... Uh, and it's like an orange cat that teaches you how to do On math. Castle. And, yeah, Spooky Castle is like a sort of standalone kind of game. Um, so it's not educational, but that's one of the later games. There's also a card game where you race. But it lasts like, I think, maybe around 26 different games of Red Cat. Um, so at first it was like a truly difficult task to find them all in an original copy of them. Also the big box copies are really hard to find. Um, but I now have since recently, I have all of them. And, uh, but what a lot of people don't know is that there are two Red Cat games that came before the actual uh, educational series. And those two are really rare. And it's before they were um, developed by Dafilex. And I recently, and that we're talking about uh, a week or two ago, I finally found a copy of the first Red Cat game. And it's the, the one on the top, yes. And I actually found it through Moby Games. So I found the, the person who edits the, the artwork of this game. And through him, uh, I was able to make a sort of trade uh, to get the actual game. I have it here. So here's a copy of Red Cat. Nice. <laughs> it's like this foldable thing with a disc cat in it. Oh, cool. And it's a crazy game. And it's, it, 
almost nobody knows about it, uh, especially internationally, nobody knows about it, but in the Netherlands, it's also quite rare. Most people know the educational series, but this is before that, where you are just a cat shooting mice with a machine gun. Uh, so it's it's a really different kind of game. Platformer, <laughs> DOS time. Um, and this is one of the rarest games, uh, rarest Dutch games out there. So I'm really excited to finally find it. And of course, now uh, trying to preserve it as well. But there are already copies of it online, but uh, they aren't really original. Some people have added files to them. So having like a real, uh, a really original copy. Um, yeah, that's that's also uh, in my interest. Yeah, it sounds like you, you know what, it's, it's great to get a game in your collection. Everybody knows it's really famous, but you know, it's, it's also really pleasurable, right? <laughs> to have a game that you know, maybe nobody's heard of this outside mm-hmm. of a small group, but you know, it's, it's, it almost makes it more important, right? Because this is something that people might, you know, if you don't preserve it, maybe it just nobody will. Yeah, exactly. That, that's one of the things. Um, also, this is Red Cat that started like a huge series that everybody knows. Uh, but these first two is are games that almost nobody knows. And then, yeah, being able to to show that part of the history from, from where it actually started. Um, like I said, that's part of the story that I want to tell in my museum. So uh, that game is like a key element in that story. Now I got already very lucky because before I had that game, um, I already uh, had spoken with the creator of the game. So um, I I know him, uh, Rudolf uh, Walterbeek is a a really uh, nice guy. Um, And he he gave me, he donated to me the master diskettes of Red Cat 1. So I already had the master diskette, which is actually more special than the the original game, but the original game I didn't have. So it sort of feel, felt like I missed a step there. <laughs> but it's it's really cool to to have the, the complete story at the moment. Yes. Huh. Well, I you know I appreciate the time you're taking here. I did want to. Yeah, I love that throne, by the way. <laughs> so, I wanted to touch on a little bit about the games because you not only collect, you also make some games. Mm-hmm. Ah yes. Now you've developed some. I think. I'm not sure which which would you say is your most popular. I would say the one you have on the screen right now, Mini Prince. Um, I think that is. Uh, uh, it's it's an interesting concept. I started this game when I was 15 years old, and oh, it's really really dark. And playing with these curtains to make the right lighting oh, every time. Right. Well, <laughs> I think uh, let's keep it like this. Um, but I've, um, I'm a big fan of Prince of Persia. Uh, I couldn't finish it when I was little. It was so darn difficult. Uh, nobody could, n- n- nobody was able to make this first jump on the spike pits. You know, you, you get this first jump and you, uh, you need to do a sort of running jump, and nobody makes it the first time because you had to press the jump button two tiles before you want to actually jump. Um, but yeah, this, everybody yeah, sort of- animation in the Prince of Persia. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of the animation back then was amazing for the, especially for- Yeah, the- yeah like it was like one of the first go- games where, uh, where they did rotoscoping. So mm-hmm. the creator filmed his brother um, running and climbing and stuff like that and jumping. And that's how they, they sort of, uh drew over uh those pictures and um to to create this character and this lifelike movement before that it was pretty static jumping oh i see what you did there so you started Uh, kind of an homage to (laughs) exactly yes yeah you found the right page to show it um so yeah when i was 15 i i created this first screen where you start in i realized that uh, like all the way in the top of this uh, article, you see like this first screen where you, oh, you stand, where you start. And when I was 15, I created in QBasic this little screen with uh, letters. And I sort of Q-Basic. realized that this Q-Basic, shape... QBasic, that brings back some memories. <laughs> <laughs> the, the tiles of this game were sort of like the same, similar uh, size as a letter in DOS. Uh, so like this, this rectangular shape. 
so I thought, what if I would replace these tiles with letters? Uh, could I sort of recreate the first screen of that game? And that's what I did in QBasic when I was 15. I created only this one screen. And now years later, I decided to, uh, like two years ago, I decided to pick it up again and, um, and make the rest of the first level, at least, uh, to make a whole playable level in that style. And it, it worked. Um, and I called it mini prints. And of course, everything had to be mini. So here you see the rotoscoping that I did myself. <laughs> yeah, so I love the, 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 the box, the little tiny box and stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When a mini prints needed to have like a, a mini box as well. <laughs> so it's like a match size box with uh, with a um, sleeve for an SD card. And you had a sticker that you could uh, put on your SD card. And there's a manual. Um, and what I like most about this game, uh, which makes it a game that I'm pretty proud of, is that I put a lot of... Um, a lot of love in this game like the, everything is in there you have like of course the game itself but also the the sounds and the music uh, the cinematics are there uh, there is a high score um, it has uh, the cheats are added to the game and it even has some unlockables i even added more to it than it was actually having before so it, it this really made it like a, a complete project it's more like an art piece than an actual game that well, way the, the smallest big box <laughs> <PC. Yeah. laughs> you always have to have the record right the, yeah <laughs> the smallest ever okay. yeah that's was something that uh, lgr uh, mentioned uh, so he fun. did a review of that game which is really great great video and uh so yeah that's that's a, a game i'm really proud of um and also because of the the media attention that it got and so and i really got excited about it it's uh, it's a whole new view on a game that I love, and it's also like a tribute as well, a fashion project. So oh, awesome! And another game that I'm uh, pretty proud of is uh, Folder Quest. What do you do now? And back in the day, there was uh, I had a friend Frank, and uh, one day on my birthday, I'm not sure how old I was, maybe. 13 years old or so he gave me a diskette for my birthday and on there were some games but before i could get to those games he made a sort of labyrinth with folders uh, so i had to search for the games that he gave me for my birthday which was really funny um, and I, I think i believe i still have the diskette um and i i uh, created uh, i thought of sort of this would this could be like a game uh, in some way and back then I started to make a little game on, on a diskette. Uh, I forgot about it and I lost it as well. And later um, another uh, person created a folder quest game called folder quest. And it was really funny. Uh, it was like uh, just basic file types. So like the, the principle of a folder quest is that you have like a text file where you read what's happening and then you have a choice uh, between folders oh okay so you can choose this folder or that folder to proceed the story oh that's pretty and, clever and this guy who he made it like a very small funny game and he added some uh, bmp paint images to it as well and it sort of evolves in a way that you don't expect which is funny but i was like all right now let's take this concept and try to give it like a lot of depth to it make try to get as much out of it as possible so i use i, I made a trailer um in folders so you can sort of um so this trailer is actually like just a, a folder structure where you click through and uh like in a world and then you click on the next folder and <laughs> stuff like that and it's and this trailer is also included in the game so when you press this trailer you see sort of um yeah, how it works. Um, <laughs> so you open up game trail. Oh, this yeah, is this will be a fun project. Oh. So let's start the music of the trailer, and then you start the music that way. And then in a world where an entire game consists <laughs> only of basic file types, 
And then, oh, wait, there's a readme, like text files. And then you open it, hey, this is a text file. And so that's sort of um, and a shortcut. When you make a folder uh, quest game, you run into a sort of limited amount of folders that you can have into each other. So it's like uh, eight or so folders, and then you have to go back. So that's why there are shortcuts. Um, and these shortcuts uh, make it possible for, for you to make a big game out of this folder quest game. And so I use that. And then, of course, there is the, these MP3 files that make the soundtrack, uh, the text files for the story. And I wanted to have like a, a story that is also based on a true story. So it's also um, something that happened in real life. So the, the locations that you go to also exist. Huh. Um, and you can even find in Google Street View some of the locations you walk through uh, in FolderQuest, which is a nice touch. And there is also a, a zip file that you sort of have to unlock and then you need to find a password for it. And But it's only basic file types. This is a uh, game. I really yeah. like this idea. It's kind of like, a, what do you call those? The, the, uh, the, uh, I'm blanking on the name, like the, a quest. Hmm. <laughs> It'll come to me in a minute. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you really have this is just so clever the way the the cool thing about it is that you don't need an engine, you don't need any programming, and it's you can create an, an entire game. It's like a, it's like a full game. Uh well it is a small one, you can finish it in a 15 minutes or scavenger hunt. That's what I was trying to think of. Ah, of course, yeah. Yeah. And it's really really fun to uh, to play around with and uh yeah, you should definitely give it a go. So I'm, I'm proud of that game as well. And there's now a big project coming up, um, which started out as a little fan art. Um, I created, you have this game, uh, the game company Guerrilla. And Guerrilla in the Netherlands is the biggest game company uh, here. And they created Horizon Zero Dawn. Uh, which is a game that I really love. It's it's gorgeous and the gameplay is so good and the story is amazing. Um, and I was thinking, all right, what would it be like to play this game on a Game Boy Classic? <laughs> so I started playing around with that idea and I made some fan art, just a little screenshot of a, a Horizon Zero Dawn, but then for the Game Boy Classic. And um, so here's Aloy. It is the main character. And it's like in a, a sort of post-apocalyptic time where machines took over the world and all of humanity has died and you sort of there's a sort of reset of the world. Um, yeah, here's this uh, this game that or this screenshot. This is the actual uh, fan art that I made just for fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a lot of cool reactions uh, of it. People approached me and said, well, wow, this would be such so amazing. And I talked to a friend about it who, who made, um, who made Game Boy games. He made a, a Game Boy game of, uh, like a sort of remake of, for the Game Boy Advanced of Flappy Bird. And um, Jay, good friend of mine. And he said that there was a, a game engine called uh, GB Studios. GB Studio, and that's an engine that's actually quite easy to use. And maybe I could look into that. So I did that. And now I thought, well, hey, this is actually something it is kind, kind of easy. And I can sort of maybe I can make it happen uh, and make an actual game of it. Uh, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. I'm trying to make the <laughs> almost the full Horizon Zero Dawn game for the Game Boy Classic, nice. uh, which is pretty exciting. And there's already like a prototype, a little prototype uh, you can play online. Um, when you go to my website, pedestalgames.com, which is like my game company, um, there you see all the project that I'm working on. And one of the latest one is Horizon Zero Dawn from the Game Boy Classic. And there you go. And of course, mini prints. But I also see Horizon Zero Dawn. Coming soon. 
yeah, well, hopefully soon, but it will probably take a lot of time still. Oh. <laughs> and there you see a little gameplay as well. Yeah. <laughs> Got some damage there. Try to shoot with bow and arrow. And there you go. And when I got this running, uh, I, I, it took me like maybe two days and I got this already to work. I was so excited to, to uh, being able to do this in two days that I thought, well, all right, maybe I can make this happen. And now I'm already a lot further. I now have uh, a demo. Um, and I even went to Guerrilla and showed them the demo. Uh, yeah, well, they was that well, so because... <laughs> My dream is to, of course, bring it out on an actual cartridge and being able to uh, give it um, with the box and the manual and poster and stuff like that completed uh, together. Um, but of course, I can't ask money for it uh, because it's not my IP. Uh, so I need permission for that. And that's a difficult process. Um, so. I, I went to Guerrilla to see uh, what what was possible, and well, there are some possibilities. So that's uh, really got me excited. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. I was afraid you were going to say, and then I said, "This and desist." <laughs> no, they were they were really enthusiastic about it, and um, awesome. to... see, there are still good people in the exactly yes yes world. yeah. The people from Guerrilla are really amazing people. They're so open minded and so creative and energetic as well um it's really cool people to uh, to hang around with <laughs> yeah it was an honor being there we'll be keeping an eye out for that for sure definitely it yes. looks like it's getting kind of dark there. i don't know what time it is for you <laughs> <laughs> um well it's it's Probably actually not time. that late I just can't, I don't have a bright lamp or so, so. Oh, it's okay. We, I think this is probably good. And so right. there's other, are there other topics that you wanted to cover that we didn't get to or? Um, um, no, we got most oh, of it. I'm going to ask you, what's that in the lower right corner of your screen or my screen? It looks like you got a little bottle there. Oh, it is. Dragon. Yeah. What is that? <laughs> it's, uh, this is not something big. It's a, a beer. Um, See, I got an eye for a beer. I can always spot it, no matter what, no matter how many things are, are there. I can identify. <laughs> I, like a, a a contact of mine, he made his own beer, and he asked me if I could make a logo for it. So this is sort of the logo, <laughs> and a lot of it had to put, be pushed in there um, to like the, these text things. They needed to be in there, and that little glass in the middle needed to be in there as well because that's their the logo of the whole uh, community that makes beers there. So. Um, it sounds like there's a pretty, it must be a pretty healthy uh, microbrew local yeah, yeah. in there, right? The, yeah, I know that the labeling is critical for that. It tasted really good and, uh, and they were really excited. And it was one of my first graphic designer jobs things as well. So uh, I was very little when I created that, to be honest. Um, what more? I have. Uh, that must be pretty cool to walk into a shop and be like, yeah, I did the label on that. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that didn't, oh, talking about uh, making labels for things ending up in a shop. Uh, and then I have this to show. It's actually a bag of crisps. <laughs> oh, so you made that? Yeah, and I'm actually on the bag as well. Oh, my God. So that's me there. <laughs> yeah, so it's Chippas, and it's uh, it's now being sold in uh, in a lot of stores in the Netherlands. So like in all of the people come up to you and like, oh my god, you're you're that guy on the chip bag, or Chris. <laughs> well, not yet. Maybe we get there. In, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, that's 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 really cool. Um, some other cool things. Another thing I can show you, which is really nice. I, got... I don't even know okay. if Lord British. I don't even think Lord British has been on a bag of chips. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. At least <laughs> maybe it's now on his bucket list. Oh, uh, I, yeah, you might be the Guinness World Record holder as far as being on a bag of chips. Well, mm -hmm. who knows? You probably need to do a couple more. <laughs> yeah. 
Would you guys share something else? I've cut you off. I don't... Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, I, I met um, uh, Hank Rogers uh, last week, uh, which is okay. really yeah, from, uh, from Tetris. So um, I got my uh, copy of Tetris signed oh. by him, which is really cool. But I was more excited um, by getting this game signed. And that's one of his uh, games that really oh, started yeah. his career. I hear a lot about that one. As, as people say, that's kind of one of those. Uh, it's really innovative games that few people know how influential it was. That sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah, it was really influential in Japan, where it was one of the first um, turn-based RPG right. games there. Uh, and yeah, it was before Final Fantasy as well. So uh, it really inspired the country on uh, making rpg games so this is really really cool there might not even have been a final fantasy and all that stuff without that right yeah well it's uh um i i i didn't went that deep into final fantasy that much but uh i loved the first few games of final fantasy and i think it has to do with the pixels i just love the pixels and uh i have here of course the the very first, oh, I don't have it anymore in my uh, cabinet at the moment. I took it to the museum to put it on display. I have um, an exhibition coming up, which is excited, um, which is about the movies made from games. And uh, there, of course, there is... Uh, movies made of, from games. Yeah, so like you have a game and they make a movie of it. Oh, okay. I like Street Fighter uh, and, and yeah, exactly. And Mortal Kombat. That's the movie. Yeah, exactly. And it all started with like the very first uh, game that has been uh, made a film of is Mario, um, which makes me want to do an exhibition about it because it goes full circle now with the new Mario movie. Mm. So that's uh, that's really cool. Um, yeah, so, the new one's probably better than the old one, though, right? <laughs> yeah, I think many people will agree with you there. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's my friend Matt's really. You might want to talk to him because he's got a lot of. Uh, he's done a lot of research into that. Ah, nice. Uh, who's that develop? U Bowl or is that his name? Who? Oh, sorry, U Bowl. U Bowl. Name right? Oh yeah, yeah. U, U Bowl. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot yeah. Of he showed me a, a link towards uh, Yu Bo, uh, his work. And uh, he's a really definitely, big when you talk about movies of games, then he's a person where you, uh, he needs to be mentioned, yes. <laughs> Which is um, not, a, not, not because of good movies, but because of many movies, maybe. Um, not all of his oh, work. Heard that he, the reason he made so many movies, there was some kind of like tax thing that he could... <laughs> okay. somehow make those movies on the cheap or even get you know make some money for these uh, not some good movies but you know it's kind of subjective you know what yeah yeah, yeah. i mean there, there are good ones people ones. love to hate those movies but i mean come on <laughs> <laughs> i think well, one of the worst ones is one of his movies in my opinion like it's alone of the dark i think that's one of the the, the least good ones out there but then again uh, it, it's always a personal thing, and uh, and it's also part of uh, of the history. So let's not ignore it, and let's embrace mm -hmm. it. Um, some there is also some <laughs> cult behind it, I think. But um, so people that want to go to the exhibition, when, when and where? Well, there is no when yet. Um, oh, and so where, this is, this is about where movie. it's going to be the home computer museum so in the Netherlands where my collection is as well um, but there is however another exhibition but then again that's a Dutch exhibition so for Dutch games um, and let me see about the date for that I think it's in November I think I no this is well, I think this is the right let me show you what I'm looking at here there we go. <laughs> is this the website for the home computer museum? It's definitely the, the place, yes. Okay, so there's probably a map or yeah, tickets. So this is homecomputermuseum.nl. Definitely. Folks that want to go, man, I would 
<laughs> uh, this is worth going just to the Netherlands, I think, just to see all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an amazing place. It's really stunning to, to see how much they uh, have been able to pull off. So cool. <laughs> Oh, okay. Like I said, I can I can live there. I can really live there for months and just tickets. Yeah, just go back in time. Want to have my holidays there? <laughs> yeah, I might have to translate some stuff, but I'll figure it out. If I just wave enough money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I get it. Yeah, but, yeah. Hey, this has been fantastic. It's so great chatting with you. Yeah, it was nice. And definitely, yeah, there's like, uh, I'm sure, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, but also important work that you're doing. Hmm. I follow my heart. That's, I think, the most important thing. I love these games and I would, it's sad to see them uh, get lost in time. Uh, so I try to do something about that. I also uh, love creating games. So that's why I have my own game company, pedestalgames.com. And yeah, I sort of go with the flow and see where it takes me. I have a job next to it, so it's it's all when I, when the kids are to bed, then that's the time where I get creative and go work on my projects. And um, I'll manage. I have fun. I have great connections, and uh, I just follow my heart. And so far, it has been a crazy ride. That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, you know, I'm sorry about the delay in between episodes. I don't know if, how much you want me to get into, but uh, it kind of sucks for me because I really wanted to start putting out more episodes more frequently. Uh, took a trip down to Louisiana to see some family down there. Uh, brought back some nasty, nasty, contagious thing. Uh, you know, I won't go into it, but it affected my voice pretty bad, so I didn't think you wanted to hear, they kind of talk like, <laughs> you know, I didn't think you wanted to hear that, so <laughs> I took some time off trying to get better. I'm probably about 99% better, so, you know, thus the episode. Uh, but hey guys, thank you very, very much for sticking with me uh, through the ups, through the downs, through the highs, through the lows, through all those dungeons absolutely infested with rats. I <laughs> couldn't and wouldn't do it without you. Now, uh, I'm at right now about 171 uh, patrons on the old Patreon, Ratreon uh, website there. I want to get that up to 200. That's my goal. I'd love to see that nice round 200 number. And if you are one of those folks that watch the show, like the show, you know, would like to hang out with me more, basically, uh, please go to that uh, link in the show notes to the Patreon site. Uh, a buck a month is all I'm asking. Or you could be part of the Discord channel. Got a great community there. You're really, really going to like it. Plus, I'm starting uh, uh, some new stuff, some new content that'll just be available to people uh, that financially support the show. Uh, so if you'd like to be part of all that, just go to that link in the show notes. And thank you, thank you, thank you very, very much for keeping Matt Chat on the interwebs. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Let's see, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Oh, Miko Selva, he's got a lot of good stuff here. One is the No Clip Game History Archive. Now, what this, uh, what this is, they got a lot of videos about, you know, video game history, basically, but they've added some things that are, uh, I guess you'd call it BTS behind the scenes, and some E3, original E3 presentations from back in the day. Uh, some ones about Neverwinter Nights, the original Neverwinter Nights, some stuff about Knights of the Old Republic, and I think they're going to be adding some more of this content. They apparently got access to a bunch of it. Uh, I guess they're going through it and, you know, figuring out what, what to post to YouTube. Uh, but anyway, it's great archival content. I think you have a lot of fun, so definitely check that out. And then over on PC Gamer, one Robin Valentine uh, wrote a really great article about uh, uh, the creators of Pathfinder. Uh, so you probably know about Pathfinder and the, this business with the uh, OGL, the, uh, what does that stand for? Uh, game, open Gaming License, I, I think that's what that stands for. I'm <laughs> pretty sure. Uh, anyway, you know, I guess it's probably been about a year now. They've kind of been going through some controversy over 
who has the rights and kind of giving and then taking back and just kind of gotten a lot of drama, a lot of mess. Uh, well, Paizo uh, did something called the ORC license. How, how great is that? O-R-C. I'm not sure uh, what that stands for either, but I like the, uh, the uh, acronym there. Uh, so they put this license, uh, it says here, uh, into the public domain. So they don't really own it, they don't control it, but they don't want any, any comp, or let me put it, let me just <laughs> read the quote here. Uh, so that means that any company is free to use it, but no company, present or future, has direct control over it. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Maybe that would be a good good news for people. You know, we talked about folks uh, you know, like Pierre doing a Knights of the uh, Chalice and, you know, games of that sort. Uh, if you want to do something that, uh, you know, players will recognize, a sort of proven system, uh, but you don't want to get enmeshed in potential legal trouble and have to take your game down or remove content or make big changes or things of that sort, uh, this is probably pretty good news for you. So that's the Orc License. Uh, and then Kelsey Lewin, uh, this is all from Miko, by the way. Uh, uh, Kelsey Lewin of the Video Game History Foundation uh, did a study. I don't know if Lewin himself or Kelsey, I don't know if Kelsey did this study or this is, uh, uh, let's see, I don't know, maybe that him or her <laughs> or they. <laughs> uh, anyway, the Video Game History Foundation did the study, and they found that 87% of uh, classic video games released in the U.S. are what they're calling critically endangered. So even though a lot of us are collecting this stuff, people like Anna, obviously, but probably you too, probably have some games at home. Apparently a lot of stuff is getting missed, just being erased from history. That's really uh, kind of frightening to think about. Uh, and apparently, uh, this is something I hadn't really thought too much about, but the Entertainment Software Association, the video game industry's big lobbying group, uh, they're the ones most responsible for uh, this, uh, th these disappearances. I don't know about most, largely responsible, let's put it that way. Because uh, uh, according to this, they're going after all these video game preservation sites, you know, basically attacking them as uh, uh, the abandoned wear type sites, trying to get all the ROMs taken down and, and all that. And I can understand it to a certain degree, but on the other hand, you know, if you're going to take those guys down, you should offer up your own alternative. Is the way I look at it. You know, they should be preserving the stuff themselves, in which case these other sites, you know, they wouldn't have a business model, <laughs> basically. Uh, so I don't know where we're going to end up with this. Hopefully we can push back on this uh, ESA a little bit. You know, I don't, I'm not necessarily in favor of people, uh, you know, not giving any money, taking these old games and, and po hosting on, on a site and making money somehow uh, with that and, and not giving some of it back to the you know, people that made the games. Uh, so I, I'm just thinking we've got to find a balance there, <laughs> you know, because we can't expect good old games. You know, they're, they're not going to do every game on GOG. They, they're, they're, you know, they want to do games they're going to sell that have some uh, a big profit potential behind them. Uh, but a lot of games don't really have that big of a following. doesn't mean they're crappy games. You know, maybe it's just people really, the word didn't get out. People don't know about these games uh, that much about them. So it would be really great uh, to have more of a movement to preserve these things without having to worry about the... ESA coming after you. So uh, anyway, I just thought that was interesting. All right, what about that ale of the week? Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. What have we got for you? Uh, I've got <laughs> a can of Busty Lush. She's Divine Oatmeal Dark. Uh, now I was at a home goods store, H-O-M, I think how you say that. Wasn't really expecting to find any beer. Uh, but they had all this busty lush stuff there, and I was really intrigued by this. It's a non-alcoholic malt beverage, I guess to be technical about it. So that means it contains less than 0.5% alcohol by volume. Uh, so it's not complete. It's kind of like decaf coffee or decaf tea. You know, there's probably a little trace caffeine in there, but it's not going to keep you up at night. Uh, same principle here. Now, typically I avoid these, just kind of like decaf coffee, you know. <laughs> Why are you drinking coffee? <laughs> you just like the flavor of the coffee, the taste of the coffee. Uh, it wasn't the point to get caffeinated in the morning with your morning coffee. Well, you know, you don't always want that, right? Sometimes you just want to be sipping on something you like the taste of without uh, the effect. Uh, so that's basically the principle here. Uh, the ones I've tried in the past, I've kind of disappointed. You know, you could really tell this is definitely not beer. I don't know what this is. It maybe it doesn't taste bad, but it just doesn't you know, hit those same, uh, those same receptors. So I was curious to see what kind of progress has been made. And so they described this distinct, silky, smooth, and sweet 
With a mild bitterness and nutty characteristics, enjoy the subtle hints of caramel, toffee, chocolate, coffee, and maple. Oh yeah, celebrate beautiful and unapologetic women. Uh, so there's kind of a, a, a women-y <laughs> perspective to this beer <laughs> or this company. Anyway, I just thought it was really cool. I like to see, uh, yeah, 100% woman-owned company. So that's really cool. Uh, but anyway, let's get it open and see what this is all about. Ah, uh, yes, the busty lush. The busty lush. Ooh, it smells good. You know, it smells a lot like a good porter, good Guinness. Let's pour a little bit there in the old in the glass so you can see the foaming action, the head on this. Got a good head, looks like a beer. <laughs> That's a good first step. You know, it doesn't look fizzy like a kind of sparkling water. I tried something called hop water. Uh, I didn't really care for that. You know, I guess it's uh, if you want to drink sparkling water that some, has somewhat of a flavor of a beer, you might try those, but you know, I think I'm going to like this a lot better. Yeah, just smell-wise, smells really good. Again, smells like a porter. You can definitely smell all the stuff they were talking about there. Uh, the nuttiness, the caramel. Maybe even a little bit of a citrusy uh, aroma to that. You know, it just smells super, super good. You always thought again it's kind of like being a it's kind of like the chocolate milk <laughs> of beer. You know, if you're that like uh, drinks like Yoo-Hoo's and, and Chocolate Soldiers, remember that one, chocolate milk. You might try that if you've never tried them before. Those the sort of dark, uh, uh, sweeter darks. Uh, but anyway, let's pour some in the drinking horn. Don't want to let that drinking horn go to waste. No, no, no. Got to pour it in the rather excellent drinking horn. The only way to truly enjoy a beer. Of any sort. All right, let's give it a taste. Mm -mm. Ah, it's good. Nice and creamy. Um, definitely kind of a light, refreshing sort of a beverage. You know, obviously, you know, <laughs> big surprise. I don't taste any alcohol <laughs> or, or smell any alcohol in this, but you know, I think it's. Let me try it again. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a sweet, lightly flavored uh, experience here. I'm going to switch to the glass because sometimes that does make a difference. Let's just switch to the glass and see if there's a difference uh, in flavor because I don't know why sometimes that happens. Yeah, you know, it's good. Uh, I don't think you would mistake this <laughs> for a Guinness or a Porter <clears throat> with a full alcohol content, but, you know, man, it's really good. Uh, I think if you didn't know what this was, and I just gave you a glass of it, you probably wouldn't assume it's non-alcoholic. You know, it's that close. You know, it's got a little, tiny little bit of bitterness uh, going down. You know, I think they might want to put a little bit more bitterness in there just to make it a little closer to some of those uh, uh, porter flavors. Let me try it one more time here. But definitely solid. Um, what? What else do I want to say about this? Yeah, you know, I feel like it's not fair to compare it to uh, uh, something like a Guinness or a lot of the, the porters, which is one of my favorite styles, because uh, it is a non-alcoholic malt beverage, you know, so it's going to be kind of apples and oranges to some extent. Uh, so I'm just going to rate it basically just on its own merits, you know, what I would think if this was uh, its own category. And I haven't tried a lot of different non-alcoholic beers, so I can't really compare it even to that. But I'm just going to say this is good stuff. <laughs> you know, I think if you were at a party and somebody poured you a glass of this, uh, you didn't know what it was, you're just walking around drinking it, I think you'd be perfectly happy with this. You know, it's got the same texture uh, of, a, of, a, of a beer. You know, it smells like a beer. <laughs> it just won't get you, uh, won't get you stupid. You know, so there's a positive right there. And I think it's it's close enough where it kind of hits some of those same uh, pleasure centers of the brain, <laughs> per se. Uh, so anyway, I'm really uh, satisfied with this. I'm going to probably go um, somewhere between a four and a five uh, drinking horns on this. Again, not saying it's exactly like a porter, exactly like a full, you know, bodied alcoholic beer, but for what it is, you know, it really stands up well. I don't think you'd be disappointed with this or... You know, say, oh man, this is so much, you know, this is so inferior to a, you know, a full on beer. You know, I, I don't think you'd be thinking that. I think you'd just think, this is good. You know, I could definitely uh, enjoy this. Uh, so let's go 
four and a half, or let's just say four <laughs> out of five stars. I got a couple more, or at least uh, one more uh, beer from this uh, Busty Lush company. We'll try that out uh, and see. Eventually, I'll be able to compare pretty, pretty accurately amongst uh, the non-alcoholic beers. But anyway, uh, four out of five on that. Let's wrap it up then with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes about museums and preservation. I'm going to kind of go with the theme. And I found one from Hideo Kojima. Or Kojima? Kojima? You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, it goes something like this. There are many museums dedicated to technology, artistic endeavors, music, that sort of thing. From that perspective, I think games really do have a place as a kind of collaborative art or a synthesis of all these various aspects into a whole, and that in itself can be perceived as art. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. It comes to this, man to man, mano a mano, toe to toe, nose to nose, shirts and skins, eggs over medium. <laughs>